start to start. That's a good sign. Okay, good. And you are recorded now. Yep. Uh, here comes the blue bar. That's very good. And I head over to the screen sharing. Share screen. Okay. Uh, start the broadcast. And hopefully, if everything goes well, you now should be able to see my screen. Can you see my screen? Examination part. Uh, OK, so thank you. You can see the screen. That's great. Examination part on Moodle, just a practice or real. There shouldn't be any uh, exams there. Uh, as far as I know, and in terms of the practicals for BI 3 and 8 and BI 3 and 1, this is uh, the this is actually the things that you are doing with me. I think you are currently also doing BI 307 uh, with my colleague Dr. Liz Curling and Emma Hargraves. Uh, but I don't know what uh, what they do in terms of practicals. So for BI301, for the enzymes, you've got the online practical, and that is part of the assessment for that module. And the other part of that assessment, the coursework for that module, is the program level multiple choice uh, quizzes as far as I know. Uh, I haven't planned anything else in terms of assessment, coursework assessment. And then, so you've, th th there are basically two pieces of uh, coursework assessments. Oh, forget that. That is the exam. I don't know why, why this is uh, visible. I'll make it, I, I, I will hide it so that it doesn't cause any confusion, but the exams are definitely not yet uh, uh, uploaded or, or, or ready. So don't worry about that, please. I will, I will make a note that I, I will hide it to avoid confusion. Uh, so don't stress about it, please. And uh, people have asked me, what do the exams, what will the exams in the summer look like? And my honest answer is, <laughs> I would love to know as well. Uh, at the moment, the university uh, is uh, sort of deliberating what the exams will look like. And I have absolutely no idea uh, how the exams will pan out. If I had a say in it, I would probably replace exams uh, with some other kind of assessment where you really can show uh, what uh, you have learned. The summer exams are usually in the third term, which starts, I think, uh, around beginning of May and ends uh, middle of June. So that's six weeks in the summer term. And this is really the exam uh, term. But because we are not very likely to have in-person exams where you, you know, trundle in, into exam halls and sit there uh, for two hours, uh, how it's going to work this year, I, I honestly don't know. And it's not because I don't want to give you the information. I just simply don't have the information myself. OK, so now let's get started with uh, a topic today uh, that's uh, actually quite important, but not very often taught in, uh, in that uh, way. So you're almost in for a treat. And this is really uh, sort of, um, well, what we have done so far is we have done the michaelis menten equation. And I just, you know, just want to write it down again because uh, I love it. So michaelis menten says the rate of a reaction equals Vmax, sorry, Daria, 
times the substrate concentration divided by Km plus the substrate concentration. And in the previous uh, lectures, we've done uh, a lot about what is Vmax, what is Km. We discussed how we can do calculations with that. And by the way, I just posted on the group chat uh, the, uh, that you can find all these scribbles that I do. Can, can you not hear me? Can people hear me? Oh, okay. Lucy, it might be something. Um, I'm underwater. Good Lord. No, I'm not underwater. Uh, is that? Let me, let me reply. Okay. Is that better? Okay. Um, I have uh, found a way how I can make these scribbles that I do here uh, in these notes. Uh, how I can uh, make them available for you guys uh, on Teams. So if you go to Teams, General Files, and there is Class Notebook. Uh, there's a class uh, notebook, I think, uh, and I upload all these uh, scribbles as PDF files so that you can actually have a look and together with the YouTube uh, recordings, this should help you with revisions. So they are already there for the uh, BI301, for most of them. Uh, I don't have any scribbles when I used uh, Excel, so I'm sorry about that. And I will do the same thing for BI 308. And uh, I will send out uh, a, a message later on today that gives you the link. The link to uh, this uh, these files is also on Moodle. So uh, it's everything is there. We just need to coordinate it. So actually, we discussed uh, Vmax and all these things and all, all that stuff is available. Um, and we also set the conditions for the Michaelis-Menten equation. And we said, if you look at this Michaelis-Menten equation, um, you notice that we are talking about one substrate here. So we have one substrate. One substrate. But if you think about it, realistically, this is not what very often happens. And some people say 60% of all enzyme reactions don't have just one substrate, they have two substrates. Uh, so for example, we might have a reaction where we have A plus B, and that gives uh, P, plus, let's say, P plus Q. So we have two substrates, two substrates, and two products. So how can this humble Michaelis-Menten equation actually deal with two substrates? Because we only have space for one substrate, which I denote here with S. And the answer is actually, it's very, very difficult. And uh, we can't really uh, deal with the Michaelis-Menten equation. Now, there are modifications of the Michaelis-Menten equation uh, that are a little bit more, how shall I say, involved and complex, but I, I'm not going to show you that because I want to avoid that uh, you sink into depression and uh, have breakdowns. So I'm not going to ask you that. But surely we need to discover uh, and uh, how, how we are actually going to deal with it. 
and there are, in principle, different uh, mechanisms how an enzyme can deal with two substrates. And to give you a uh, realistic example of, from real life, um, the first mechanism that we are discussing, first mechanism, how an enzyme can work with two substrates. So how an enzyme works with two substrates. And the first example that I want to do is I is just a sort of an almost entertaining example, although if you are at the receiving end, it's not terribly entertaining. Uh, many, many years ago in uh, the Stacy building, that's the, the place where you uh, did the uh, practicals, when you did the practicals, in the foyer, we had a coffee machine. And everybody loved this coffee machine, or rather, I should say, it was a love-hate relationship. Because um, you put your money in, then you choose coffee, and guess what happened? Have a guess what might have happened sometimes. Put the money in, choose the coffee. It took your money. It stole your coins. Well, mm. oh, you got chocolate milk. Yeah, occasionally. Uh, you also could get uh, tomato soup. You never got, no, you did get coffee. But what occasionally happened, what occasionally happened is you pressed the coffee button and lo and behold, guess what? Coffee came out. Fantastic. You got your coffee. And then 10 seconds later, the mug came out. You know, the paper mug. So first came the coffee and then came the mug. And that was, of course, absolutely no point. Now, when you complained, the company said, OK, let's check how many mugs did we dispense? How much? There is no discrepancy. So we don't know what this guy is talking about. <laughs> uh, no, it was just a, it was just a little uh, hatch. So it was really annoying. And occasionally you got a mixture of coffee and tomato soup as well. So this shows us that sometimes it's really, you have to have an ordered sequence of events. And that's why this first mechanism is called an ordered, ordered sequential mechanism. Ordered sequential mechanism. Ordered sequential mechanism means you have to bind, need to bind substrate one, substrate one first to the enzyme, and then A new binding site, a new binding site for substrate two becomes available. Becomes available. Uh, 
And then substrate two can bind. Substrate two can also bind. And then we form the products. Brilliant, because I just wanted to ask you, have you, have we ever encountered something like that? And then I already uh, said it's like for the uncompetitive inhibitor. If you remember, we have to bind the substrate first. Then there is a conformational change in the enzyme which makes the binding site for the inhibitor available. Only in this case, we are not talking about an inhibitor, we are talking about substrate two. But the concept is exactly the same thing. You are absolutely right. Um, so how can we actually look at that? And let me just quickly move over because I discovered here a really good website, uh, Chemistry Libre Texts, uh, which is talking about uh, multi-substrate systems here. And that is really what I just uh, talked about. We have A plus B, so substrate one and substrate two, and they produce the products P and Q. And in this sequential mechanism that I was talking about, we have to bind one substrate first. So here is the example uh, of something that's uh, quite uh, important and which we will discuss uh, more in detail in the metabolism part. So here we have a two substrate Uh, reaction. We have a compound that is called pyruvate. So pyruvate and another substrate which is called NADH, H+. So that is substrate A, substrate A, and that here would be substrate B. And we then get product product P and product Q out here. Oh yes, you will meet respiration again. And what actually happens is that, uh, let me quickly move over uh, again to the, the other side. So here we've got COOH, COCH3, and we convert that into lactate, COOH, C. H O H C H three, and uh, this is a reaction where the pyruvate, this one here, pyruvate, picks up two electrons plus two electrons plus two protons, basically and is converted into the lactate. So this is the oxidized compound. Oxidized compound and this is the reduced compound. Okay. And we have here a reaction where we have two electrons on the left hand side. So is this an oxidation or reduction reaction? What do you think? Uh, 
what do we have here? Is this an oxidation or a reduction? Vernon, you're absolutely right. It is a reduction. Why? Yes, we gain electrons. And you are familiar with the acronym. What's the acronym here? Oil rig. Wonderful. Oil rig. Does everybody know oil rig? Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. So oxidation. is loss of electrons. R reduction. Reduction is gain of electrons. Go down a bit. That what you meant? Up. Oh, okay, good. So pyruvate picks up two electrons and two protons and is converted into lactate. So that is the reduction reaction. Here. And what is the oxidation reaction? Well, we have this compound NADH. H plus. No, we haven't finished that. We are just looking at a particular reaction. And we are coming back to the two substrates. So the NADH delivers two electrons plus two protons and becomes the oxidized species. So that is the reduced form and that is the oxidized form. And you need this information for the next program level multiple choice quiz. Oh. Oh, I should not have said that. Okay, forget that. So we've got the reduced and the oxidized form. And together, if we put these together, we get the equation that they show here, pyruvate plus NADH gives us NAD plus plus lactate. So that's the formal mechanism. It's a redox reaction. We will discuss uh, a lot of these redox reactions when we go into more detail. Yes, I will do a cheat sheet for you, don't worry. Uh, when we go into metabolism. So how does this now look like in shorthand? We have an enzyme here. And in this particular enzyme, this enzyme is called lactate dehydrogenase. And you spelled it out here. Lactate dehydrogenase, and this has a uh, very specific order, this enzyme. First, it has to bind NADH. You need to bind NADH first. And only if we have NADH bound, we then open a new binding site. New 
binding site becomes available. New binding site becomes available, and then we can bind pyruvate in the second step. And then what we have here is we have, if you like, a complex of, as it shows here, enzyme plus NADH plus pyruvate. So this complex here, this complex here is made up of three compounds. This is this just has something to do with the way this is uh, transported, the uh, the the or, and and written the NADH. Don't worry about it. We will discuss that in a little bit more detail when we come to the uh, respiration. So, how many compounds are in this complex? How many compounds are in this complex? How many different compounds? Three, absolutely right. So that's why it's called a ternary, ternary complex. Okay. And then when we have this ternary complex, the um, the substrates are converted into the product, into lactate here and into NAD+. But we still have this ternary complex. In the next step, the lactate is released and then the second substrate is released. Uh, the second product, I, I beg your pardon, the second product, the NAD+, is released. So there is a very, very clear order. And as a very characteristic feature, we have a ternary complex. And the way we can write this is just sort of a timeline like that. NADH, the first substrate, goes in and we indicate that with an arrow like that. Then the second substrate comes in. And again, we indicate that with an arrow. They form the ternary complex. And then the first product is released. And we indicate that with an arrow going up. And the second product is released. OK? But NADH, in this case, has to bind first. So that is this ordered sequential mechanism, or sometimes people also call it ordered, ordered ternary complex mechanism. So ordered ternary complex mechanism. Uh, I'm not too keen on the sequential mechanism uh, phrase because uh, sequential just means that one has to bind after the other, and uh, that's always the case. So I really like the expression ordered ternary complex more than uh, ordered sequential mechanism, but you find both uh, expressions uh, in the literature. And this notation that you see here uh, with this timeline or event line, this also has a name, this is actually called Cleland's notation. Cleland's, some, some people call it also Cleland's plot. This is just this timeline, this event line that you see here. Does that make sense to you? So, Ordered sequential or ordered ternary means you have to have exactly the right order. Cup first, coffee then. If it's the other way around, it just simply doesn't work. Does that make sense? Are you happy with that?
Okay, so now let's move over to exactly the opposite. And again, let me start that. I will give you the link to the web page. Actually, I will give you this uh, annotated web page that you have here uh, as a PDF on the Teams channel. So don't worry about that. Because I found out how to do that. So you get the PDF of this annotated website. Hopefully. So let's move on to a different mechanism. And here's a question for you. Uh, we do a little poll. Um, when you have a cup of tea, right? I noticed that people, especially people in the UK, spoil a nice cup of tea by putting in milk. They dump cow's juice in it, which I find absolutely disgusting. Tea with milk for me is a total no-no. I know why people do it. Uh, why do people put milk in the tea? <laughs> why do people put milk in the tea? Actually, it's not just the biscuits. It has it has a far more sinister reason. If you take just if you just make a cup of tea, black tea with normal tap water, what you find very often is a layer of all sorts of gunk on top of it. Have you noticed this? It's a very thin layer that uh, floats on top. Have you seen that? When the water is not filtered. Next time, when you make a cup of tea, have a look. This is because the water is contains all sorts of horrible stuff in it, all sorts of ions and compounds and all these things. And this is actually the stuff that gives you the tea stain in the cup, lime scale, all, all sorts of things. But if you put in milk, the protein in the milk will bind that stuff. It's just simple absorption. And therefore, if you put in milk, you don't see this disgusting layer that you still drink. Well, that's not what I'm talking about here. Okay, so people put milk in the tea. Now, now what do you what do people put in first? Do they put in milk first and then the tea? Or goes the tea first and then the milk? No, it doesn't make any difference. So tea first, tea then milk. Tea first, only a reasonable way. This actually is interesting. Because it tells me a little bit about your class. Milk and tea, that's interesting. Mm. So we have people who say milk first, then tea, but the majority says tea first, then milk. That's interesting. 
Because what would the queen do? Not make her own tea, that's probably true. Actually, no, the queen does the tea first and then the milk. The reason is, if you put in tea first, boiling tea, you put in boiling tea and you have crap china, what will happen to the cup? Boiling tea, crap china, what will happen to the cup? It will crack. Exactly. So how do, uh, how do you avoid cracking the crap china? Cup kaput, indeed. How do you avoid crap china cracking? Actually, You put the milk in first, exactly. So if you are poor, you have to put in the milk first so that the mug doesn't crack. But if you are rich, you have good china and you can put in the tea first and you can show the world how rich you are because you've got good china and therefore you put in the tea first. So upper class, used to be, I don't think it is anymore, upper class demonstrates how wealthy they are. They can afford good China. They put in the tea first and then the milk. Lower class, no, not lower class, working class has to put in milk first and then the tea. Why am I talking about that? Because we might have actually enzymes that don't care which substrate comes first. So in Cleland's notation, we have an enzyme We have substrate A, so we have enzyme A substrate, then substrate B. We get a ternary complex EAB, which then converts into EPQ. And then the enzyme doesn't care which one is released first. It might be P release, and we have EQ, and then release Q. And we get the free enzyme back. Or we have it exactly the other way around. So we have B binds first. So we have EB. Then comes in A. And we have our ternary complex. We might want to release Q first, so we have EP, and then we release P. So this would be the Cleland notation. Yeah, that's a miracle. So in Cleland notation, you get these two pathways in a way if the enzyme does not care which substrate it wants to bind first. So this would be what is called a random sequential mechanism or random ternary complex mechanism. And basically, the enzyme doesn't care 
which one first? It can do either way, which of course means that the both binding sites for the substrates must be available at the same time. It's not that one side only becomes available when the substrate has bound, the first substrate has bound. In this case, both binding sites are available at the same time. Does that make sense? Brilliant. Now on this website, they also talk about a random sequential mechanism here. And there's no particular order. So here's an example of um, an enzyme that follows this uh, random sequential mechanism. So we have a substrate one here, substrate two is ATP, and we get product one, so that would be P and product Q. And it doesn't matter which order this actually binds. So these are the sequential, the uh, ternary complex mechanisms. But we also find that very often the enzyme follows a very different path. And this is what is called a ping pong mechanism. And in this ping pong mechanism, what happens is we have an enzyme here. Substrate A binds, which is denoted like that, like we had with the ordered uh, sequential mechanism. And now this substrate modifies the enzyme. Look at this reaction here. We have a complex EA and the enzyme converts A into the first product. And at the same time, the enzyme is modified, which is indicated by this little dash here. So for example, it could be phosphorylated or some other kind of modification. So A binds and P, the first product is released. We have not bound the second substrate at that point, but we already release the first product. This modified enzyme then binds the second substrate. That's the second substrate here. It cannot bind the second substrate first. So it has to bind a first, because A then leads to this modification of the enzyme, and only then the enzyme can bind the second substrate. So we form this E dash B complex, and B then is converted into Q, and the second product is released, and we get our product back, uh, our enzyme back here. So what we have is basically ping pong. Ping pong. Do we ever form a complex with three components? Absolutely right. In this mechanism, we do not form a ternary complex. So no ternary complex. That's really important. We do not have this ternary complex. What we will get 
is a modified enzyme and uh, very often we can isolate this modified enzyme. All we need to do is we just need to add A, the first substrate, and if we add the first substrate, we will get a product, we will get the product and the modified enzyme. So, so upon addition of the first substrate, we get a product out and a modified enzyme. If you look back at, let's say, this case here, if we just add the first substrate, if we just add NADH, will we get a product in the sequential mechanism? Will we get a product if we just add one of the substrates? Absolutely right. In order to get the product with the sequential mechanisms or the ternary complex mechanism, we have to add both substrates. In the case of the ping pong mechanism, we can add one substrate, the right one, and we immediately get one product. We won't get two products, we only get one product. Why is it called ping pong? Well, it is just one goes in, another one goes out. So ping pong, ping pong, ping pong. Uh, at least that's my uh, explanation why it's called ping pong. I'm sure there is a far more uh, uh, cerebral explanation, but uh, I think that is uh, ping, Substrate goes in, pong, product goes out. No ternary complex. We can depict that in a line weaver Berg plot, and that uh, for a ping pong mechanism would give us, if we keep the concentration, uh, what we keep the concentration of the second substrate constant, let's say B1, and measure different concentrations of A. We get a line like that. Then we change the concentration for the second substrate, and again measure different substrate concentrations for A, and get another line like that. And we do that for increasing concentrations of B. What we find is that we get basically parallel lines. Parallel lines in a line with a Berg plot, which indicates a ping pong mechanism. And people usually say, oh, if. Uh, Uh, if we get these parallel lines, then we have a ping pong. I think there is a much easier way. If you just add one substrate and you get a product out, you know you have a ping pong mechanism. Now, what, how this could work, let me head over to the uh, other screen. Let's say we have... Um, enzyme, we have ATP here. So we form an enzyme ATP complex. Here we transfer a phosphate onto the enzyme and we get ADP. Right, and this ADP is released. So what we have now here is we have an enzyme that is phosphorylated like that. Now we put in a substrate, 
B, whatever this substrate is, we form an enzyme that is phosphorylated complex with B. We now transfer the phosphate residue onto B. And what we have is enzyme B with the phosphate group attached. And we can release now B with phosphate group attached, and we get the enzyme here. So what we see is we have here in our previous notation, this would be this E prime, but here we no longer have the prime because that was the compound that had been attached uh, from by the first substrate. So here it would not technically be E prime. And I think that uh, answers the question uh, that uh, Vernon uh, just asked. So what we have seen today is how we at least can work with two substrate reactions. That there are basically different mechanisms. Let me go back again. We can have the sequential mechanisms where we have the strictly ordered sequential mechanism, strictly ternary complex mechanism, or we can have the random ternary complex mechanism. And an alternative way for enzyme to deal with a substrate is the ping pong mechanism where we just simply don't have a ternary complex but instead have a substrate bind, and this is converted into a product. Next, and the enzyme is modified, and we can isolate the uh, first product and the modified enzyme, and that's quite important. And that really distinguishes these different uh, mechanism types. So, I hope this makes sense. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you uh, learned something. And if you've got any questions, I hang around uh, for five minutes, uh, but otherwise uh, I shall see you on uh, Friday for the next BI301.